Hi, welcome to Meet and Eat Together. My name is Melissa Gerson. I am the Clinical Director of Columbus Park Center for Eating Disorders in Manhattan. I am also the director of My3 Square, which is the platform we're using today. And my guest today is Lucine Wisniewski, who is a researcher, a therapist herself, a trainer, and a consultant. And she is a star. So I'm really excited for her contributions today. We are going to get to Lucine in a moment. Uh, but first, we're going to walk through the structure for the day so everybody's oriented and aware of what to expect from the next hour or so. Um, this, uh, this session today is going to replicate a therapeutic meal. So we're going to go through the motions of what we do in a treatment center when we're having a meal with our patients. So the first thing that we do, at least in an outpatient center, the first thing that we do is we all check in about the meals that we've brought. Uh, we, we provide general guidelines for the meal. The guidelines we provide are pretty loose. We'll say we'd like the meal to be balanced. We want to be sure that the meal is adequate to meet your needs. And the meal ideally will incorporate a protein, carbohydrate, adequate fat, and perhaps a fruit and vegetable or a vegetable um, or a dessert. So I'm gonna share my meal. So we, we usually go around the table and we share the, our components. And, and we also often will talk about how we put the meal together. So my meal today is a meal I've done on this program before. And uh, it is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with sliced banana and milk. And you might wanna notice how beautifully my bananas are, are sliced today. Um, so my 10 year old daughter made my meal today and it got me thinking about, you know, I would never slice bananas so beautifully for myself for my lunch meal. And it got me thinking about how oftentimes we, the way we take care of other people and the way we feel, feed other people is much, is sort of more caring and generous and thoughtful than the way we often feed ourselves. So I just wanted to note that you know, this is a beautiful presentation and it made me think maybe I'm going to try to think about presenting my food with this much, this much care uh, if I can over the next few meals. Um, also just sharing how I came up with this meal. I'm limited by what we have in the house as everybody is during this crisis. Um, I felt a little bit like something sweet. So the idea of peanut butter and jelly was appealing to me this morning as I was kind of thinking about this meal. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but in terms of the portioning, a sandwich generally has two pieces of bread, so that was pretty easy. We shy away from having little puny bread, breads, like Ezekiel bread is one that often comes out up, like, you know, really small, or we try to shy away from English muffin sandwiches. Although if you want to do an English muffin sandwich, that's fine, but generally you could do two English muffins as opposed to one, because it's just not much bread. So this is sort of standard bread, which is a reasonable sandwich. I cover, usually cover the peanut butter enough to cover the bread so I don't see bread anymore. And that's how I know I've had enough peanut butter. I'm not measuring it or anything like that. And then enough jelly to cover the peanut butter. Uh, and this looks like it's probably a small banana, which is reasonable. And then I have a nice full glass of milk. For me, you know, peanut butter and banana and milk just you can't have one without the other. So that felt like a way to make my meal more adequate so I'm not hungry afterwards. It added some extra protein. I've got the protein in the peanut butter, the protein in the, in the, uh, the milk. I've got a, a little bit of a fruit and I have my carbohydrate in the bread. So um, I'm, I'm actually hungry right now and I'm looking forward to this meal. Lucine, tell us about yeah. your meal. Well, and I'm well like, hello. Thank you. This Thank is you. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I think this is such a great idea, um, and I am honored to be a part of it. So I might have sort of the other end of the continuum on um, taking uh, sort of nice presentation and sort of thinking about you know making your meal be um, something special. So I generally I'm in my office today. I'm not my in. I've been working in my home office, but my we have got too many people in my house right now. And so I'm in my actual office and I'm lucky enough that my building is open that I could come and sit here, although there is nobody here but me and it's a little odd. Creepy, I'm glad um, we're here with you. Yeah, and I don't, I'm not somebody who um, decides what I want for lunch. I generally pack leftovers from the night before's dinner. That's the way I normally do my lunch. So I have my um, 
not Tupperware because I'm trying to actually not use Tupperware. I'm this is like a ceramic container and it is a it's chicken fajita. Um, and there was not so I packed it last night thinking, okay, that's a, a, a portion enough. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's not quite big enough. And so this morning when I was packing, I wanted to find some sort of carbohydrate and I was late because I'm not used to driving into the office. So even though I'm not keeping kosher for Passover, we had matzah on the counter. So I grabbed some matzah and I still actually don't think that this is enough food. So I um, made sure that I brought change for me to get some um, peanuts in the machine afterwards if this is not gonna likely be enough. If, I, if it's longer than before I'm gonna head back home to yeah. eat more. So normally I would have some rice and some cheese in here and that just didn't happen. So the, so, but, so again, I'm modeling yeah. for you how that normally happens for me. So if I've not prepared enough, I'm gonna make sure that I get something extra from the machine. And the other piece about this not being, uh, this being again, very typical for me, I've been back to back all day and I didn't even get a chance to heat this up. So now, I will eat it. I will eat it anyway because it's I'm hungry and I need some food. Uh, but it is certainly not the most gourmet meal I've ever had. Um, you know what? I like what that brings up, though. It's an opportunity to talk about how often with eating disorders, there can be because there's so much deprivation. Often, oh no, I hear someone coming in. Okay, Drew, <laughs> the daughter has to get out of the room. I'm okay, sorry, this is the this is the magical human that that oh that's you did a great banana so beautifully. I can do that later, but no. I'm in the middle of something. Okay. It's coding, it's coding, it's coding. Hey, no, I, I can't do it now, I'm sorry. Okay, that's called setting boundaries. <laughs> Not really. Um, there is a sign on the door that says in session. Yeah. Um, but it, it reminds me, Lucene, about how often with eating disorders, there's a lot of deprivation. And so meals become more important in a sense, and it becomes an opportunity to take care of yourself. And so sometimes it feels so important that you, you want the meal to be definitely exactly really right. delicious and really mm -hmm. precise because it's an opportunity you don't want to sort of waste it you know I hear people say they don't want to waste it or they want to waste the calories and so you kind of want this meal to be so delicious and it puts a lot of pressure on the meal and and what people find as they work through recovery is that the meals aren't aren't don't have that same level of importance that in a way you get to a place where you can just eat because you know you have to nourish yourself and it might not be the tastiest thing ever but you know, you just know that you just, your body needs it and that you've increased the importance of other things so that the actual meal itself doesn't feel as important. So it may not be the place where people are in this moment, but it's a place that they'll get to eventually through the yeah. recovery no, process. I think, I think that's right. That's a, I think that's a great, great point. So the next thing we do after we check in on, on the meal components is we set an intention for the meal. So that's something that you're going to have on your mind, something you're going to be thinking about during the meal, maybe a goal, maybe a challenge for yourself. And I have a proposed uh, idea for our intention if, if, if anybody wants to kind of follow along with the intention that I'm setting, inspired by the fact that my meal was, was prepared with a lot of care. I'm thinking about incorporating self-care during this meal and self-compassion during this meal. And that, you know, if you can think about, for those of you out there who are struggling with disordered eating, oftentimes during a meal, there's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of kind of harshness in the way that we talk to ourselves. There's not, oftentimes people are not kind of approaching themselves with the kind of care that we might share with other people, the kind of care that we give other people. So my challenge for today is to ask you to, as much as you possibly can, try to treat yourself like a good friend. Try to treat yourself in this moment like a child, that you care for yourself, you wanna nurture yourself, you're here because you're nurturing your intellect and you're expanding on your recovery concept and you're taking in information and you're going to nourish your body as you would want to nourish a child and just see if you can take on that perspective and see how that feels and every time you might move into a judgmental place or a, a harsh self-talk place or you you lose some of that hold on that compassion self-compassion just notice it and try to bring yourself back to the compassionate place so I'm going to start eating my meal. Lucine, you're going to do the best you can, but you're going to be doing most of the talking. Yeah. I'm setting a timer uh, for, for halfway through the meal. So we're going to try to eat our meal within 30 minutes. I'm going to set the timer to go off in 15 minutes so I can give everybody the notice that we're halfway through. Then I'm going to give you a five-minute notice when we're 
when we're kind of trying to wind down the eating portion, we're going to be chatting with Lucene uh, throughout and I'm going to be eating throughout. So I'm going to try to keep a steady pace. You can, if you're, if you're working on pacing, you can follow along it with my pacing. If you'd like Lucene, you'll just do the best you can. I just set the timer. And I just want to say that Lucene is, um, has been, an absolutely central part in the development of my practice and in the development and emotional health and professional health of my clinicians on my team, because she is an incredible trainer. She just is a, a, an absolute international leader in eating disorders. And she has been a consultant with my practice for two years, maybe more now. I think it's more um, than that. And has trained up all of my clinicians on my team and you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of other providers around the world. So this, we are very lucky to be learning from Lucene today, to hearing her wisdom. Uh, and I just, I hope that you all enjoy it. I am going to definitely be watching and learning and enjoying the process. So Lucene, I'm turning it over to you. You are going to talk today about best practices in eating disorder treatment. You know, what are the treatments out there right now that we know about that we see as most effective and go for it. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that when Melissa and I were preparing for um, me to come on the show, <laughs> it was a little bit like a show. show yeah. Yeah. Um, was thinking about what might people need to hear about. Um, and I think that my background in, so I really trained as a researcher first. Um, I really actually, you know, my story is that I never wanted to see a patient. I only ever wanted to be a researcher. And it's kind of funny how things change with experience uh, because now I mostly do clinical work and I, I only do a small amount of research. But when I first went to graduate school, my interest was to see, pay, to, to do research. And so that very much influences how I think about therapy because I, I believe that uh, you know, the research that's out there needs to be considered when we're deciding um, which treatment to offer to somebody. Um, and I also believe that as therapists, because I'm assuming that not everybody who's watching is somebody who is watching because they're, they're needing help with their own eating. Maybe there are also some therapists out there that I, and I, and I want, if you're there as a patient, for you to be aware too, that I, I believe that as therapists, um, I like to quote Superman's uncle that with great power comes great responsibility. So we, we have as a job as a therapist to make sure that we offer to you because you're coming to us in a vulnerable place usually, um, especially when, when we're saying that you might have an eating disorder, that, you, that, that we take your problems with very great seriousness and make sure that we offer you what we know from science to be the best treatment. So in that, you know, if you think about it, if you went, if you had a skin infection and you went to see your doctor, your doctor should know the difference about, well, does that skin infection need penicillin or amoxicillin? Like, don't ask me, I have no idea. I didn't go to medical school. Um, I'm a psychologist. But if you came to me and you said, geez, I have an eating disorder, which treatment? Well, I should know which treatment is the right treatment to offer you. And part of the deal, just like if you have a skin infection, um, what kind of skin infection you have is going to determine which antibiotic you get, um, or if you get one at all. Um, and so the same happens if you have an eating disorder, which eating disorder you have is going to govern which therapeutic modality you're offered, right? And so there is something in, uh, in the eating disorder field that we're um, called the uh, APA guidelines, the American Psychiatric Association has printed out guidelines. Now, actually, uh, depending if you're, because you could in theory be watching from all over the world, many internet, many other countries have their own guidelines. Now, as part of the Academy for Eating Disorders, I'm on a um, part, of, I was asked to be part of a group that is putting together international, uh, like for the Academy for Eating Disorders, which is the premier eating disorder academic organization um, that is invested in both research and treatment for eating disorders is we're putting together a comprehensive set of recommendations for the treatment of eating disorders based on international recommendations, if that makes sense. And that should be coming out, I don't know, soon. 
Um, but if you look for each country, there are recommendations for which treatment you offer depending on the diagnosis you have. So I'll start with the easier ones. So if you are somebody who has binge eating disorder, um, you are lucky enough that there are several evidence-based treatments for the treatment of binge eating disorder. And the first of which is cognitive behavioral therapy that is shown over and over to be effective in the treatment of uh, binge eating disorder. Now, to a lesser degree, we know that DBT is helpful. And uh, actually I should say IPT, which is interpersonal psychotherapy. The first, and I say CBT, you should know is cognitive behavioral therapy. So in case you're watching and that's not a familiar uh, acronym to you, cognitive behavioral therapy is the treatment of choice for binge eating disorder. And then interpersonal psychotherapy and then to a lesser degree, dialectical behavior therapy. Now, one of the things that I wanna say is, um, you know, so when you're thinking about getting treatment, the first step is which problem do I have? Because the, pro the treatment should match the problem. That's what I'm trying to. So if you've never been through an evaluation with your therapist to be clear about which exact eating disorder do I have, because not everybody fits nicely into a category. Um, and then what is the treatment that is uh, best for the problem that I have? That's a conversation that I would recommend that you have with your therapist so that you're clear about it. So Sorry, I'm going all over the place. Yeah, I just want to bring yeah, one thing up. Help me. Yeah. I, I didn't hear you um, in the treatments for binge eating disorder, at least, I didn't hear you mention psychodynamic psychotherapy, which is what we also refer to as more of a talk therapy, more of an insight-oriented therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and psychotherapy, um, psychodynamic psychotherapy is quite pervasive. Like, I think most people, when they think about therapy, are actually thinking about more of a dynamic psychotherapy because you think about it as a place that you talk about your history, you talk about past struggles, you talk about your day to day, what's going on for you, and you know, having a place to vent and to receive support and to talk through and gain insight. And so I think it's worth noting that that treatment is actually not the considered the first line treatment for binge eating disorder, and neither is it the first line treatment for anorexia or for bulimia, that the eating disorders are behavioral disorders. They are just, you know, they are difficulties with very specific behaviors. And so the, the treatments that we generally go with, with the exception, I guess, of interpersonal psychotherapy, which is a kind of a second line treatment for yeah. binge eating disorder, but the treatments are highly behavioral. And what that actually means is that you're not talking so much about about your history, your family, your upbringing. You're not even talking so much about day to day, what you're thinking about and dealing with only so much as it relates to your eating disorder or your eating behaviors, do you do that? So if you need to talk about your history, it's usually very much related to how it's impacting the behavior today so that you can really, you know, you really need that robust, really intense focus in order to change these behaviors. No, that's, I think so, that's a great think, point. So, and yeah. I think that one of the things that often happens even you know, like how, how do you know what kind of therapy you're getting, for example? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you might want to ask your therapist, like, what is the therapeutic approach mm -hmm. that you're using? And so a psychodynamic psychotherapy, which is fine for many things, there actually though is no evidence that it is, well, I shouldn't say there's no evidence. There's little evidence mm -hmm. that it is helpful for these behavioral problems. And one of the, the um, rationales that I often give to people is, you know, insight oriented therapies are great for you to help understand why you might do something, but they don't generally help you to change. They mm -hmm. help you understand. And so I give the example that I'm afraid of dogs. I'm afraid of dogs because I was bit by a dog when I was a kid. So it makes total sense that I'm afraid of dogs now in my adult life, but it doesn't help me diddly squat when I am. Such a great example. When the, when the dog next door is coming over to say hello to me, who is a very nice dog, but I'm still terrified because I can, in my head, I'm like, I know that this is why I'm upset and this is why I'm scared, but it doesn't help me to change my behavior. And I would say the same thing is true when we come, when it comes to eating disorders, I might understand that I got these messages from my family. I might understand that I got these messages from the environment and this is why I behave the way that I behave, but it doesn't help me to change it. So that, I love that example that eating disorder so perfectly said, yeah. And I, and I, so, you know what, I should probably finish what I was saying about which therapy, and then I'll come back to how do you know if you're getting it? Great. So then for bulimia nervosa, 
it's a very similar list of, of treatments that we know are effective. So it's cognitive behavioral therapy to start, interpersonal psychotherapy, and then also to a lesser degree, dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and, and at some point, if people are interested and they wanna think about, you know, like, okay, well, uh, I, I, my personal opinion, my educated opinion is that you always start with the one with the most research first. Mm -hmm. There's no reason, unless you have some compelling reason why to, that you would start with a, a different one. So for example, if you have suicidality or you have other sort of significant emotion regulation problems, you might start with DBT, mm -hmm. but almost to a person, we start with CBT because it has the most data behind it. If that's not working, then we'll move to one of the other treatments. And just one thing I wanna say about that too. Yeah. CBT is the most efficient. <laughs> CBT that's is a very point. efficient treatment. So when we're thinking about you know, we want to get results and we want to want to do so in the least amount of time possible mm -hmm. and for the least amount of money possible. You Great know, point. obviously, you know, therapist as a therapist, it's my livelihood. Um, but what I've learned over time, like I need to be able to earn my living. But <clears throat> I, I noticed that getting people better is better for business and getting people better faster is really good for business. So, you know, the idea that we, this first point. line treatment CBT, it's, you know, it's, for binge eating and bulimia, it's ideally somewhere around 20 sessions or so. It's a bit longer for anorexia, but we're gonna try to get results as quickly as possible. Um, and so again, it, not only is CBT got the, has, has it got the most evidence, but it's also just efficient. It's gonna cost you the least amount of money and it's gonna take the least amount of time. So let's go with that one first. That's yeah. a great, that's a great mm -hmm. point. That's a very important piece. Now, anorexia is a lot harder. Um, we are, as a field, we are not, do not have a unified way to manage anorexia, but we know that there's no way to get over your anorexia unless you do more of this. There is just no way to be able to make progress unless eating is a, is mm -hmm. a part of that process. Uh, just because it's part of the, it's part of the, um, the, the behavioral manifestation, but it's also a physiological aspect of it that needs to be addressed. And so most people will start with cognitive behavioral therapy um, or CBTE, which is the enhanced form of CBT as a way to start. There are some other types of treatments that have a little bit of data, but I say again, that's the treatment that has the most research behind it. Now, part of the deal to me is and I've seen this happen because I do a lot of training of therapists as well. And so I want you as, as, as um, people who are using our services to be able to know, how do you know if you're getting CBT? Because I've had people come in and say, oh yeah, I had CBT treatment. I've even had people come in and say, I've had DBT treatment. Um, and then I ask them a few questions in there. And when they say no, I think, okay, no, you haven't. So for example, if you're getting CBT, you should have homework at, after every session. There is homework involved and goal setting involved in what you're doing at every session, or at least most sessions, right? So if you're not getting homework, you're probably not getting CBT. Do you have a self-monitoring log? Do you, are you recording what you eat and your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors? If you're not doing those as part of your treatment, you're probably not getting CBT. And is your therapist weighing you or is somebody on your treatment team weighing you? And is that part of the, the evaluation of your treatment um, progress? If you're not doing those, then you're not getting CBT for eating disorders. And so I think it's important for you to, again, ask yourself questions, mostly because now listen, if you're not getting any of those things and you're getting better, more power to you, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I've been known to say to people, listen, if what you figured out works for you is painting every other toenail purple on a full moon, even though there's no evidence that it helps anybody else, I don't care. That's great. Do mm -hmm. more of that. But if you're not getting better and you not, and your treatment doesn't include those things that I just described, then maybe you want to have a conversation with your therapist about, you know, are, are we doing the most evidence-based treatment for the problem that I have? And I think, you know, it's worth noting that a lot of providers will use eclectic models. Sometimes you'll hear the word eclectic or integrated. And so they may use components of a number of different therapies. And 
similar thing. That's okay as long as it's working for you and you're getting better. But if you're not, it just may mean that it's diluting the treatment in a similar way as if you kind of put a little bit of water in an antibiotic, you might not be getting the full dose. Yeah. And for some people and for some eating disorders, the full dose of CBT is really what it takes in order to get the kind of change that you need. Um, so just a quick note that we're 15 minutes into the meal. So we're about halfway done with the eating component and I'll let you know And um, when we're five minutes up. Oh, and this isn't, I'm supposed to say this because I always forget to say this, but if you happen to have any friends that you think might appreciate this conversation, please, now would be a great time to invite friends, to tag people, share, clap, whatever it is out there that you, that we do to, <laughs> to, um, to, to have people join us, please, please do so. Um, okay, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no problem. Mm. So I think that, so, so again, so if we, if we think about, this is the way that I think about what somebody new comes to see me, number one, what is the diet? What is the main problem? Is the main, and then I want to make sure that the treatment I offer matches the main problem. And I don't actually believe that every therapist is a good match for every patient. And just because you have an opening, just because you found a therapist with an opening doesn't mean that they're the right therapist for you. So number one, do we know what the problem is? Are we matching the therapy with the problem? Um, number two, if you're already in a therapy, then are, am I getting the full dose of the therapy? Um, no, am I, am I, I told you the components that you would need to see for CBT. Um, DBT would really be the same, DBT for eating disorders would really be the same components. Um, and if you're not getting those, uh, you might wanna then have that conversation with your therapist. Can you help me? And this would be the language that I would use. Can you help me understand what is the, what is the framework that you're using to treat me? And can you help me understand why you're not using this other treatment? Because they may have a very good rationale for why they chose what they chose. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I don't think it has to be a contentious conversation. Although frankly, if your therapist sees it as a contentious conversation, I think that's a red flag. Uh, because I think as, a, as someone who sees patients, I, I want people to come and say to me, hey, I'm wondering about this. I'm curious about that. Why did you do this? That doesn't work for me. This helps more because then we're going to get, you're going to get better faster. Um, so I, I recommend that if you're not getting those things, you go back and you ask your therapist, okay, help me understand why I might not be getting that treatment. Cause I heard that that was the treatment that has the most research. And I would like to understand why I'm not getting it. Um, and then if also, I suppose like even uh, back further, if you're looking for a therapist, I would be, that would be a conversation I would have going in. Is that, it, are, this is the problem that I think I have. Do you have training in this therapy? Um, and what kind of training do you have in this therapy? It is totally an okay thing for you to ask a potential therapist, help me know what, why you're the best person for me to see if I have this problem. Um, again, I like to tell people just because I'm a warm, nice body doesn't mean I'm the right person to help you. I need to have the, I need to have the skill set to be able to help you as well. Lucine, I'm curious your feeling about this. Is it an, also an appropriate question to ask um, a potential provider what their outcomes look like? Oh my goodness. It would be a fantastic question. <laughs> and, if, and if you are somebody who collects outcomes, which I know Columbus Park does, um, <laughs> then you can actually answer that question. You know, like, I think sometimes people, um, there are a lot of, okay. <sighs> All right, so I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> okay, you, you wouldn't know, I'll show you. This is my, this is the other side of my um, office. And oh, this yeah, is a picture. That. That's the Bayonne Bridge. It's not the Sydney Bridge. It's the Bayonne Bridge because I'm from. And you're Bayonne. in Ohio now, so I'm in Ohio now. Yeah, so, so I need to keep a little bit of New Jersey yeah, with me at all. New Jersey, <laughs> right? And so I would. I'm here to tell you that there's a, there there can be, um, schlocky therapy, uh, for lack of a better <laughs> word. Um, and I think that it is our job. And I'm I, and I know that that everybody's trying to do their best. But if you have an eating disorder. You, do, you can't do schlock. You have to get the right treatment. 
uh, because there is not evidence that it's not just a nice warm person is gonna help you to get better. You need somebody with skill and you need somebody with skill who has good outcomes. And so if you, if you can ask that question, like, hey, do you, have, do you collect outcome data? Do you, can you tell me what is the likely outcome for me to do treatment with you? That is gonna be, to me, if you hear that they collect data, then you should say, oof, I, I, this, I'm definitely gonna be giving this organization or this therapist uh, an extra look because if they have enough awareness that they are paying attention to outcomes, uh, that's gonna be in your best interest. You want someone who is trying to, to figure out how to get you better faster. Um, and if you're collecting outcomes, then you're more likely doing that than not. So I think that's, I, I appreciate you're asking, you're highlighting that question. I'm going to take a bite. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting because um, for Columbus Park, for I guess the first 10 to 12, probably 10 to 11 years of the practice, I personally responded to every inquiry that came through our, our, our phone system or email system. And I thought it was, I think it's really interesting that very, I, I think maybe I could count on one time, one hand, the number of times people asked about outcomes, you know, what are the chances of me getting better if I come to your center? And it, I reflect on the fact that, you know, God forbid you have a diagnosis of something like cancer. You know, the first thing that you would ask a doctor that you would see for treatment would be, you know, what are my chances of survival? What are my chances of being, um, getting well, you know, this particular treatment that you're going to give me, has it been tested? You know, how many people out of a hundred will get better using this particular treatment? Is there another treatment that will give me a better shot? And without question, you would always take the one that has the highest probability of getting you better. And, you know, if the doctor said to you, yeah, I mean, I don't have numbers or anything, but I, I think this one will make you better you know, mm -hmm. you would be very frightened and you probably wouldn't feel comfortable moving forward. And I think it's just really interesting to me based on my experience all these years that we just don't ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, it, maybe it speaks to just how scared people are when they come into this process and how difficult it is to find good therapy. And I, I think one of the things that feels most important to people when they make these calls and as it should is just the feeling with the therapist, you know, do I have the right feel? Does this person make me comfortable? Do they feel like my style? Like, do I feel connected to this person? Do I like them? You know, do I like this person? And that is super important. Like you, you know, you want to feel connected to your therapist, but there are many other factors that are so critical in this first step. And, you know, just one other thing I have to say, you know, uh, it is really a luxury if you can interview therapists and you can choose a therapist based on the one that has all of these features that you're looking for. But the reality is sadly that, that it's very hard to get good treatment. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to afford good treatment as well. Um, and so I, I wanna sort of acknowledge that and acknowledge just how important it is for people to be their own advocates and their own teachers in a sense. And, you know, to identify if there are particular organizations where they can, um, they can, they can turn, where they might be able to get some in information to get kind of the correct answers, and even to be able to get materials that they can use to educate themselves and perhaps even bring to their providers. So for example, mm. you know, let's say you're living in a place where there's really no providers that have been trained in, in enhanced cognitive behavioral therapy but you feel like you, you listen to this talk or you've done your own research and you recognize that that's an important treatment for you. Well, you know, you could actually bring the manual to your provider and you could even say, can we work through this manual together? Because the manual is actually pretty straightforward um, yeah. and, um, and, and is, is intended actually to be a guide for, for even folks that haven't had a ton of training in eating disorders in particular. So, that would be actually like a very reasonable thing, you know, to bring the material to your provider. Maybe you have a provider that you really like, but that who's not doing CBTE, you know, bring the manual and work through it together. 
You know, um, it's, I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea. I'm really glad that you brought it up because it is yeah. one of the things that we've been doing more of, I think, both with the fact that we now in two different ways. So one is just as you described. So maybe you have somebody that you're seeing face to face, but doesn't have the skill set that you do. I've been doing a lot of training with therapists on using what mm -hmm. we call guided self-help. Mm -hmm. So it's using these treatment yeah. manuals, uh, often they're workbooks. Now there, there, there are more and more of these that are available to us, but it's, it's knowing which one's the right one that's actually based in research. Um, but you can do it in conjunction with a therapist and you can do that face to face, but you can also do it over the over the internet. You know, this. Um, I don't want to say that that there's any silver li lining to this COVID crisis. I mean, there's it's just awful. Um, but one of the things, so we and here um, at in my organization, we've been doing teletherapy for quite some time. So the shift from doing some teletherapy to doing all teletherapy was really not a big transition for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing this guided self-help with people. Do you need to tell everybody? I just want to say that we have five more minutes until the, the 30 minute meal meal time is over, but you, you can take your Thank time. You. Yeah. Um, but that we've been, we use these uh, treatment manuals that have been um, usually what they are is researched treatments that have what we call randomized clinical trials behind them. So that's the highest level of uh, research evaluation, and then those treatment developers make them into workbooks that are available to therapists and clin and uh, patients alike. And then we use them as a way to walk people through the treatment over the internet, because sometimes people just don't have access to be able to get people mm -hmm. uh, who have the skill set close at hand. Yeah. Um, and so the the notion of bringing it to your therapist is I think a brilliant one. It's really, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a great idea. We sort of do it the other way around. We're like, okay, well, listen, we know these treatments, here they are, let me give them to you. But if you are listening to this and you wanna learn about those evidence-based treatments and can get your hands on those workbooks, then you can bring them to your therapist. I think that's, a, that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, Lucine, maybe could you speak a little bit to, um, your your feelings your 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 concept of recovery and what it's a little bit off topic but i i think just hearing from your experience you've had you know you've been doing this for such a long time and you've treated so many people and you've also trained so many people so you really have a lot of material to to work with a lot of data yeah you know, first off you know what is your sense of what does recovery look like for people and you know i think also what what people can expect in terms of what, what achieving recovery. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, Melissa, I, I tend to shy away from that terminology just because I feel mm -hmm. so overwhelmed by what is it and people have different conceptualizations. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to yes, answer it yeah. a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so number one, I want to say, yes, I've been, I've been treating eating disorders for the last 30 years and I don't know. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, you know, I've, I've uh, worked with a lot of people. I've trained a lot of people. I have crossed paths with many patients and many therapists. And so I feel like I have a pretty good sense about how this generally goes. And I'm here to tell you that people can get better. And it almost, you know, I think that sometimes people get hopeless about, well, I've had this illness for 20 years. How could I possibly be different? I have seen people who have been sick for most of their life turn around the illness and have yeah, a yeah. quality of life that is well better. Now, are they recovered? I, that's where it hurts my head. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know. There's lots of different um, definitions of recovery. And so I'm not sure about that, but can they have a better quality of life? Absolutely. Can they have eating disorder thoughts and behaviors not rule their life? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that part of the message that I want to give is number one, don't give up. Mm. So, this is a um, this is where in in my head, if you're old enough like me, there's a there's a great Kate Bush uh, song uh, with um, Phil Collins that's "Don't Give Up," and it always goes through my head when yeah. I. But, <laughs> um, but I think that you know, like part of the process is it does take a long time for some people, and there's actually data to support. There's this great data out of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard where they studied people for 20 years out, and that people do get better. And some of them get better later in life. It's not 
that if you didn't get better the first time, then you should just forget about it. Yeah. As therapists and as clients don't give up that having a better quality of life is possible. And then maybe you can ask somebody else about the term recovery. Cause I don't. Yeah, I don't no, I like that. And I like, I like a different frame and thinking about yeah. a different frame without question. Um, and, and as you were speaking, it reminded me of kind of another question that I really wanted to ask you. I love the way you talk about motivation and how, how much when you teach us how much motivation and commitment to treatment is, is really part. It, it's just such a huge part of treatment. Yeah. So is there anything that you can share with our viewers about that concept of motivation and how, I know it's such a big topic, but how you build motivation in the people that you're working with. Yeah. And I, and I love that you said build motivation because part of what happens is people often say, well, that person's not motivated or mm. I'm not motivated. Yeah, yeah. Well, so then what does that mean? Do you have to go to the motivation store? Like if you yeah, don't have right. motivation, where are you supposed yeah. to get motivation? And, um, you know, just today I had a session with a family where part of the deal is, um, Fig, you know, and I actually said to them, listen, I'm going to teach you about behavioral management, behavior, contingency management is part of what happens because their daughter had not been motivated to change. And mm -hmm. so what we did is we found the thing that she was really interested in doing, which is to be able to go abroad for school. And mm -hmm. parents said, well, you can't go abroad to school unless you do X, Y, and Z. And the, it's interesting because now that we had the X, Y, and Z that she needs to do, she's like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Now, mm -hmm. so what does that mean? She's magically motivated when she wasn't motivated before. I think it's about building contingencies, helping people see that they can, the things that they want are more available when their eating disorder is managed. And so in that situation, you know, we're talking about a family where parents have uh, control over their child's ability to do X, Y, or Z. But for most of us, if you're, if you're not in a situation where other people control your availability to things, you can still build those motivators yourself. So yeah. I have a patient who um, wants to buy herself a new pair of shoes. And so for every week that she does not binge and purge, she puts money into a jar for herself as a motivator and she's willing to not buy herself those shoes until yeah. she gets that money. Like there are ways for us to yeah. figure out how to make the thing we want more attractive by setting up contingencies. Yeah. And I wonder, this will go into, um, we're going to take a break for just a second, but I, I want to just say something. Yeah. Uh, I, I really love the concept of building your own internal motivation, even, even without like an external factor to drive you, like even without, you know, the idea of like a trip that you want or the shoes that you want, but the idea that in your own mind, you are creating like almost a pros and cons list of getting better and that you are identifying the benefits of getting better versus the consequences of getting better. Mm -hmm. And we often find that's really helpful to kind of, to do a pros and cons assessment at, yeah. at the start of treatment and also when you're feeling stuck so that you can really remind yourself and connect to what is actually important to you, what is at the end of the tunnel and try yeah. to make that just like more vibrant, stand mm -hmm. out a bit more and really recognizing also, you know, what is the cost? What is the cost if we don't change? Because changing and doing this work can feel very, it's very painful, it's very difficult much of the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. but there's a cost of not, you know, it's not like if you, if you avoid really working through this stuff, you know, it's not like it's, everything's going to, you know, suddenly be, you're not going to suddenly get everything that you were hoping for. There's often, often there's a cost. So I want to, I want to talk about pros and cons and any other motivational strategies that you, you want to share with the group. But I want to mention that we're now at 30 minutes. So Generally, ideally, you're going to want to work. If, you have, if you're not finished yet, you want to work to a point where you can eat a lunch meal in 30, within 30 minutes. What we do in a treatment setting uh, after we eat a meal is usually we do a quick check-in on how people are feeling, although we don't want to open up a lot of feeling at this time because uh, we really want to be able to move on. I've, I've spoken about this before, the idea that we want to eat and run. We want to be able to actually complete our meal and then move on to the next important activity without 
being stuck with feelings or thoughts that are that are um, distracting you or taking up a lot of your energy and space. We want you to use the nourishment to energize you to do other things. So what we often will do is check in on the feeling, check in on the intention. How did it feel? Did you, were you able to engage in this intention? Did you feel that you had some success in the intention? And then we usually try to teach some sort of skill or reinforce the skill or talk about coping ahead and, and what skills we're gonna use going into the afternoon. So in terms of the intention around self-care uh, throughout the meal, I know personally, um, I, I didn't I didn't actually do so well with that. Um, I think because I was very distracted. So I was eating in a really distracted way. I was engaged with Lucene and really thinking. So there was a lot going on at the old at the same time. So I really, I don't think I was able to really practice that intention. Um, so I'm gonna try to do it another time. And so I'm gonna ask that folks out there, you consider, were you like me and sort of unable to do it in the moment for one reason or another? Did you try? Did you think about it? Um, and if not, might it be something that could be helpful to you later? Um, and so now we're also going to, in this moment, uh, move on in that we're gonna distract ourselves now and we're gonna turn back to Lucene to talk about motivation strategies and, and maybe starting with the concept of a pros and cons list and then anything else that you think would be helpful for us to share around motivation, like strategically, you know, anything concrete we can hold on to. Would it be okay if I shared my screen? Absolutely. That? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Great. This is something, this is the other, um, I like to make lemonade out of lemons uh, and the, the, the COVID lemons are, are one of the things that great. I've been doing yeah. a lot. So I'm learning how to use Zoom yeah. and the fact that there's this whiteboard. And so I'm oh, always, I yeah. do a lot of sort of teaching with patients like this over the whiteboard. And so, and I, and, and, and this is also a, a lesson in flexibility uh, because I did not bring my pen, my writing pen. So I'm going to be oh. writing with my finger. Okay. Which, and, and even though I yeah. went to 13, 13 years of Catholic school, I still have terrible handwriting. <laughs> so hopefully you'll understand what I've got. So when I do pros and cons, okay, the important thing is that there's two sets of pros and cons. If you want to use pros and cons um, for yourself, uh, and we're going to talk about it in terms of building motivation for, uh, I don't, you know, again, recovery is the shorthand, yeah. but I might say pros and cons of changing your eating behavior. So I could just be really specific. Okay. Yeah. So, so pros and cons of changing eating. Okay. So you can see that's a delta for changing, changing eating. Got the important it. thing that you want to do is you need to do it. You need to do it twofold. You want to say pros and pros and cons of changing eating, but you absolutely still want to do the pros and cons of not changing, of eating. not changing eating. Yep. Because they're not this, there's, there's going to be some overlap, but they're not the same thing. And it really gives you an important difference in perspective. So mm -hmm. like I might say, okay, if I'm working with somebody and I want to help them, because if you go through these steps, you can, if you've written them all down, you can carry them with you mm -hmm. for helping when you're faltering in your motivation, you can laminate them, you can make them your screensaver, you can have it pop up on your computer every day, like there can be ways in which you use the data from this to be able to inform your and build your motivation. So might might someone might say, okay, the pros of changing eating are that I have more energy, that I'm more flexible, and I'm not going to write these because that'll take mm -hmm. too long and plus, yeah, yeah, you won't be able to read it. Um, the cons of changing eating are I might feel uncomfortable, it's going to be really hard. Uh, it, this is what I know how to do. Um, and those are more clear. The pros of not changing and the cons of not changing are often where people learn something about themselves. So the pros mm -hmm. of not changing might be people might, aren't going to expect too much of me because I'm going to be stuck in my eating disorder and less will be expected of me. The cons of not changing are I might actually be able to have a life that I want, because that's a con of not changing. So I would want to change. I understand that it's a little bit of a thought it's a puzzle. Tricky. Yeah. Right. But then once you have distilled it down, you can use what you've written here 
as a way to be able to continually motivate yourself. I highly recommend writing them, not just doing it in your head, because in a moment of stress, the only thing that you're going to remember is this mm. or this. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. But so you want to be able to remember these pieces mm -hmm. and you won't be able to do that in a, in a moment of stress unless you have it written down. Um, so, and I will often in a, in a session, if I'm doing pros and cons with somebody, I will give them the pen and paper and have them write it down so that they can take it with them. Or if we do it on a board like this, we'll write it all the way out and then have them take a picture of it so that they can have it for themselves. Mm -hmm. But these are the kinds of things that really, frankly, you can do pros and cons of doing or not doing, changing or not changing pretty much anything this strategy ought to work for. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I, you know, I, I often forget that idea of having both sides, the pros and cons of, of doing something and the pro pros and cons of not doing something. And I do see how they're very different. You know, so people, people will also tell you, well, I have, you know, 15 pros of not changing and only one pro of changing. And that may mm -hmm. be true, but sometimes that one, that one factor, it's not like, it's not about sheer number. Yeah. I had somebody that I worked with who had a lot of, let's see if I can do this in my head, a lot of reasons to not change, except mm -hmm. that she just had a daughter mm. and she was really worried about if she didn't change her behavior, that she was going to teach her daughter how to have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And so that, that one factor was big enough to combat all of the other reasons to not change. So yeah. don't think that just because you have a lot of factors on one area and only and less in another area, it means that they're equal. Yeah, it really, it, you know, anything can be a very powerful, strong, powerful motivator. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you almost need to weight each line item mm -hmm. for how robust <laughs> mm -hmm. the factor might be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have the the, the con is that, you know, it could impact your daughter in a negative way for the long term. But a pro is that in the short term, it makes you feel better. It, it, I could see how you might really in the moment question, you know, maybe, I, maybe I, it's worth feeling uncomfortable in the moment in service of protecting my daughter, you know? Yeah. And that's often what it comes down to is short term versus long term, because yeah. in a lot of pieces in eating disorders, it, the, the behaving the way that you need in the short term is often really hard. Yeah. And yeah. it's all about long-term, um, uh, long-term, I don't know, benefit. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's one of the other pieces that I think about with people when they're first starting treatment is what is your big picture goal? Cause sometimes they come in and they say, well, I want to stop binging and purging or, well, I want to eat more adequately. Well, that's fine. But in the service of what? because in the moment doing those things are really mm -hmm. hard. And so mm -hmm. unless you have a big picture goal, like I want to be able to graduate from college and, and my eating disorder has made me have to drop out every semester and I want to graduate. Okay. Well, that's a great big picture goal. So yeah. then when you're sitting yeah. there and you're deciding, should I eat this or shouldn't I eat this? Should I purge or shouldn't I purge? You have something to link that up to. Well, how does this decision get me closer or further away from my goal of being able to make it through the semester? Yeah. So yeah. I think that's the other way to be able so to bring sense. in that motivation. That really makes so much sense. Thank you, Lucine. Lucine, I don't, are you still sharing your screen or am I back on? Because I, I want to say goodbye to everybody and I want to do I'll, so I'll, by I'll making share. eye contact. <laughs> Who are you making eye contact with? Hang on. I think you, <laughs> right now at the moment it's you, but I think there probably is someone out there who, you know, I can make eye contact with. All right, now if I know, now so let's see if I can figure out how to unshare it. Yeah. Well, okay. no worries. I'll do it while you talk, go ahead. In spirit, I'm, sh I'm, sh I'm sharing eye contact with everybody. And Lucine, I really thank you for joining us today. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I really thank you so much for this. This was such a great conversation. Uh, and I want to encourage folks to come back. Tomorrow we have Shira Rosenbluth, who's a clinical social worker. She's a, a therapist and she's also a, a blogger with a very, very big following. She's really uh, engaging. She talks a lot about body positivity and combating weight stigma. And so she's gonna share her own recovery story 
talk about her work uh, and her passion. So I hope that you'll return tomorrow at one o'clock. You can also feel free to refer to the My Three Square. It's my, the number three, and then the word square.com website because we have a calendar up there with all of our upcoming guests. And you can also go back and, and screen um, to view past recordings. So all of our guests so far over the last few weeks, um, we've recorded everything. So you can view and um, it might even be a nice way if you if you decide you want the support over the next few meals over the next couple of days, you can actually replay a video while you're eating your meal and you kind of benefit from the support already that we've provided. So I hope I hope everyone has a sane day, a peaceful, healthy day. And thank you again, Lucine.